The markets in Asia have just opened. The Shanghai index is down 6% right now. This comes one day after what's being called China's Black Monday. The collapse of China's stock market today was followed by drops in markets around the world. Here in New York, the Dow fell 588 points today. President Obama's press secretary, Josh Ernest, said this. The president's not made any calls to Chinese officials uh, about this, but uh, the president, uh, as a matter of course, is updated on on developments in the economy. The Treasury Department has been closely monitoring uh, global markets, including those financial markets uh, in China. Um, you've also seen readouts that have been issued by the Treasury Department uh, of conversations that Secretary Liu has had uh, with senior Chinese uh, officials in the last couple of weeks. Most of those conversations, however, have focused uh, on the recent shift in China's exchange rate regime uh, and its economic uh, reform agenda. And this is consistent with the case that we have long made to, made to China, uh, that they should continue to pursue financial reform to increase uh, exchange rate flexibility uh, and to move rapidly toward a more market-determined market exchange rate system. Tonight, Bill O'Reilly began the discussion of the subject with the front runner for the Republican presidential nomination by admitting that he, Bill O'Reilly, has no idea who the president of China is. And then Bill O'Reilly treated Donald Trump as Fox News China expert. Why do you think the stock market's going down? Well, you look at what's going on with China or generally with Asia. And, you know, I've been saying for a long time on your show and on anybody else that wanted to listen that we're tying ourselves so closely to Asia and in particular to China that this is going to be trouble for our country. And not only now have they taken our jobs and they've taken our base and they've taken our manufacturing, but now they're pulling us down with them. And I said, we can't do this. We can't allow this to happen. And we have to do a big uncoupling pretty soon before it's too late. This afternoon, Republican presidential candidate Scott Walker said President Obama should cancel a state visit with the president of China. Why would we be giving one of our highest things a president can do, and that is a state dinner for Xi Jinping, the head of China, at a time when all these problems are pending out there? We should say those should only be, those honors should only be bestowed upon leaders and countries uh, that are allies and supporters of the United States, not, not just for China, which is a strategic competitor. Joining us now, economist Jared Bernstein, senior fellow at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities and an MSNBC contributor. Also with us, Robert Reich, former Clinton Labor Secretary and professor at the University of California, Berkeley. He's the author of Saving Capitalism for the Many, Not the Few. That's out September 29th. Also with us, Josh Barrow, reporter for The New York Times and an MSNBC contributor. Professor Reich, uh, do these Republican candidates have it right? Do they have anything about this situation right? I, I don't think they have anything right, Lawrence, uh, about anything, but particularly about the situation. I mean, the idea of, uh, of somehow dividing the world, uh, getting ourselves uh, independent of China, the largest economy in the world, uh, is absurd on its face. This kind of isolationism, jingoism, kind of, uh, you know, uh, first Trump hated uh, Mexicans, or at least gave the impression he did, and now it's all the Chinese fault, uh, this doesn't help the situation one iota. Uh, the big problem here, uh, if there is any fault at all, it's that China is growing so fast, it's the biggest economy in the world, and it's not as transparent as it needs to be. It's hard for investors to know exactly what's going on in China, which means that it is easy to overshoot in terms of hopes and also overshoot in terms of fears. Uh, let's listen to more of China expert Donald Trump with Bill O'Reilly tonight. Bill, our government, our government should have stopped China from devaluing. They, they never can't. even bring them up. It's the number. Of course they can. How? You know how they can? Yeah, how? Very simply. Bill, it's so simple. They put a tariff on Chinese goods. All right, you know, you China. Gotta, then you got a trade war. All right, you have then have you got a trade. Uh, you have to do that. And All then right. you bring it back to normal. You have no choice. You okay. do that. Our government doesn't even. And by the way, China does it to us. Do you think that we sell to China without a tariff? They call it a tariff. I call it a tax. No Jared Bernstein, your reaction. Well, I'm pretty, uh, I'm closer to Bob Reich than uh, Donald Trump on this so far. <laughs> Let me put it that way. Uh, I, I do think that uh, there is 
A good question, I think, in the economy today is to how much exposure do, does the American economy have to uh, these upheavals that we've seen in, in the last uh, few days, particularly today in the markets? That's actually a good substantive question, but you won't get that at all from the kind of bombastics you just heard from Trump. For example, I'd love someone to ask Donald Trump uh, what share of U.S. exports uh, go to China. Because if China is weakening, one might say there's a problem for the U.S. economy if our share of exports is uh, particularly large. In fact, it's about 7%. Uh, that's not nothing, uh, but neither is it uh, anything that's going to derail uh, the U.S. recovery. So, yes, we're very interconnected, and there are real issues here. I don't think you're going to get them talking to, uh, to politicians who are just trying to scapegoat. So, uh, Jared, uh, we've been running a segment on the show called Questions for Donald Trump that we hope will at some point will be asked uh, in the presidential debates. But here's the, here's the key to it. You don't give the answer, okay? You just give the oh, question, yeah. Yeah, and, then, and then we let yeah. Trump try to figure out the answer. Uh, well, let's listen to what uh, Carly Fiorina said to Chuck Todd yesterday about this. Let me start with the news of the week uh, in the markets. You obviously is a, a former CEO. What's going on? Well, frankly, I think it was inevitable. I was expecting this a bit sooner. It's inevitable because you have a huge economy like China slowing down. The Chinese economy clearly is struggling now in a serious way. That has a big impact. You have the Federal Reserve. It's going to have to stop printing money eventually, and people see that coming. Josh Barrow, uh, there's a little bit more substance in that answer. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the first part of that was correct, mm -hmm. which is that China has been growing at 8% or more a year for, for decades, um, which was not going to go on forever. And we're seeing a slowdown, as Bob discussed. We don't know exactly how much of a slowdown it is because the data that you get from the Chinese government is not very reliable. They say their, their economy is growing at 7%. Yeah. That's pretty clearly not true, but, right. but we don't know what the right number is. But I think something that we're not getting from the right or the left is that this this interconnectedness is inevitable. We saw a statement from Bernie Sanders today about how this is a result of years of unbalanced trade policies. And we have had unbalanced trade policies with China. But the thing is, if those policies had been balanced, if China, back when its economy was growing strongly, had had a stronger currency, hadn't been basically playing with the, symptom, the, the system so that their exports would be uh, especially cheap, basically, they would have been selling us less stuff. We would have been selling them more stuff. We would still be very interconnected. In fact, we'd be sending more exports to China and we would be more exposed to risk when the Chinese economy falters. So I think what we need from politicians, which is honesty we're not getting, is that this interconnectedness is inevitable in the world today and we just need to figure out how to create buffers. We actually had a really big policy success 20 years ago. There were financial crises that swept through Asia. All these crises that happened there, the U.S. government and other governments around the world put up a lot of money to protect governments that were under pressure from their creditors because there was a financial panic. That's the sort of thing that can be necessary in situations like this, those are the sorts of things that, that government needs to be prepared to do. It's not about scapegoating and not about painting this as us versus China, because in fact, right here, we're dependent on China doing the right things for itself. What we want now, now is for China to do things that will grow its own economy so they don't drag us down. Uh, Lawrence, if I could just uh, go, go pipe in just quickly. Uh, you know, uh, blaming China or even making this conversation centered on China uh, does uh, sort of uh, alleviate the United States of, of our own responsibility here. I mean, we've got a middle class that has not grown in terms of uh, purchasing power, uh, and yet uh, we expect somehow we're going to maintain enough purchasing power to continue to grow the economy. That's absurd. Uh, secondly, we still have a financial sector that is engaging in a great deal of speculation. People are concerned, for example, about commodities markets. Well, look at Wall Street and look at the speculation in commodities. Look at the volatility we've had. Uh, you know, volatility is directly related to speculation. Uh, so let's not blame China for everything I that's think, going on um, today. I think that's a great point. And I also would like to distinguish between the stock market and the real economy. Uh, I didn't think today was uh, pretty by any stretch of the imagination. It was an ugly day for the stock market. But the stock market is not necessarily the real economy. And when Josh correctly points out that China is slowing down, we don't know how much, uh, if it is growing, say, at 5%, uh, that's not a, a disaster for China. And in fact, uh, much of what China is trying to do is to grow a little bit faster through internal consumption and less excessive, bubbly kinds of 
of investments. So actually, I'm not sure that the interconnectedness, which is very real, is painting as negative an economic picture as it might sound. Markets are doing their thing. These financial markets are doing their thing. They're correcting some big bubbles. I'm not sure that the underlying growth picture is obviously a, a, a big problem going forward. We'll have to see. Josh Barry, you know, that thing you mentioned from Bernie Sanders, I, I read that, and it wasn't all that clear to me that he was specifically referring uh, to the stock market drop today. There, w there was real silence out of the Democratic side of the presidential campaign. That's why I'm not playing you anything mm -hmm. that the Democratic mm -hmm. candidates had to say about this, because they didn't say anything about this. Yeah. Well, I mean, I th there have been real problems that have been created in the U.S. economy from trade policies that have created these imbalances. We've basically had high unemployment for years, in part because we've run these big trade deficits, let China make everything instead of us making everything. There isn't really news about that this week. So that's a fine thing to point out, but that doesn't really have much to do with what's going wrong in China's stock market or what's going wrong in our stock market.